Hey guys, what we're going to be getting into this chapter is the idea of federalism. Federalism is this sharing of power between the national government and local governments, or in our case, state governments. Uh, this was a new thing uh, that our founders or the delegates at the Constitutional Convention uh, developed. Uh, it, we didn't have this under the articles. This is something new that we created. And this is really important. This topic, this idea of federalism, is super important. Uh, in my advanced government class, we have an entire unit dedicated to federalism. Federalism is the most important part of the American way of life, of the American system of government, with the federal system, the national government, and local governments. It's the sharing of power between these two. It's not a unitary system where the federal government's up here and they tell all the local governments what to do. And it's not a confederal or a confederate system where the states have all the power and they tell the federal government what can and can't be done. This is a sharing of power and it gets kind of messy. Uh, there's uh, some of these powers are overlapping. Some of these powers, uh, both of them can do, both the national and state governments can do. Some of the things that only the federal government can do, there's some things only the state governments can do. And there's some things that the state's government can't do. And there's some things that the federal government can't do. And then there's some things that neither of them can do. It's really confusing. Uh, this first section goes through all of this. And so this is a this is going to be a long video. Uh, feel free to stop it after a couple slides, take a break and come back to it. Uh, but we're going to just hit all of this uh, now. So we have the question, why, why should we have this federal system of government? Why federalism? Well, think about what we had. We had a confederal system and it wasn't working out. The national government was just too weak. The states had all the power. Now, some people like that. In fact, a lot of people liked having a weak central government. After all, we just got done fighting England, which had a super strong central government. So we said, no, we're not going to do that. Let's have a weak central government. Let's give the states all the power. Well, that just wasn't working out. The national government couldn't uh, raise money to fund an army. Uh, they weren't able to provide stability. Uh, they weren't able to have economic unity. And so that uh, the confederal system just didn't work. And then the idea of a unitary system, that was a non-starter for the Constitutional Convention. They said, we're not even going there. We're not going to have that. And so we had to come up with this split the difference type of thing. If you remember, I talked about a pendulum swinging back and forth. And on one side, we have the, a unitary system or a super strong central government. And then we have a super weak central government. Well, a federal system is in the middle. It's a pendulum swinging right in the middle. However, people were really suspicious about the federal government having any sort of real power. So it's going to take some winning over. And you know it took some winning over uh, to get this Constitution ratified. <clears throat> we know with the uh, federal system of government, it's splitting powers. And uh, Montesquieu, in his book, Spirit of the Laws, said the best way to protect people's freedoms and rights is to divide up the power. It's to prevent the government from becoming too powerful. And so uh, we're going to split up powers between the national and state governments. Uh, national defense, currency, uh, let's see, relations with foreign countries. That's going to be the national government's uh, responsibility. And then everything else will be remaining with the states. Now, uh, I don't want you to get confused. This is not the idea of separation of powers and checks and balances. It's not the same thing. Separation of powers is uh, the three branches of government. This is not what we're talking about. This is not checks and balances either. This is uh, a different, this is the system of government with the national government and then states and the sharing of power between them. That's what we are talking about. Let's look at the powers of Congress and the powers of the federal government. And there's all sorts of powers that we're gonna go through. 
Uh, we have expressed powers. These are also called delegated or enumerated powers. We have implied powers. We have concurrent powers. We have inherent powers, reserved powers, denied powers. <sighs> Confusing, I know. So that's why I said, let's take it slow. Uh, when it's too much, pause it or rewind it uh, and then start up again. But what we're going to look at first are uh, powers that we call expressed. Expressed because they are written down in the Constitution. Expressed, you say it, they're listed, they're out there. We can find this in Article 1, Section 8. And Article 1, Section 8 is literally a list. And I'm going to take you there in just a second. But it says, Congress shall have the power to do these things. And it's a list. And so we're going to take a look at this list. There's also expressed powers in Article 2 and 3. <clears throat> but let's take a look at these powers right now, these expressed powers that are specifically listed in the Constitution. So here we have the Constitution. If you want to pull up a copy of the Constitution, go ahead. We're in Article 1. We're at 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right here. Let's even see if I can make this a little bigger. There we go. Congress shall have the power to, and it's a list, lay and collect taxes, to pay the debts, uh, to borrow money, to regulate commerce among the several states, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. So how do you become a U.S. citizen? To coin money, uh, to, uh, to punish counterfeiting, to establish post offices, to promote the progress of science. Uh, this is going to be copyrights and trademarks. You know, if you invent something, you can uh, create a patent or get a patent. That's what we're talking about here. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. They put that in there because when we get to Article 3, which is the judicial branch, uh, they didn't know exactly how it was going to be set up. And so they put literally in this Article 3, they said, we're going to have a Supreme Court and then we're going to have other courts. That's what they said. And so in Article 1, Section 8, they said Congress has the power to set up smaller courts below the Supreme Court. This is a good one. To define and punish pirates. To declare war. To raise and support an army. To maintain a navy. To make rules for the land, for the army and navy, to call forth, to call up the militia, to provide organization for the militia. And then uh, we can come down, they exercise exclusive legislation with the District of Columbia. Then the last one, Article 1, Section 8, Number 17, I believe to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. This is what we call the necessary and proper clause. Another name for this is the elastic clause. We're going to get to this in just a minute because this is going to end up being really important. So let's go back to expressed powers. So these are specifically listed in the Constitution. And I rattled them all off there. It's Article 1, Section 8. Lists, this is what Congress can do. Now, we have implied powers. Implied powers, they're not specifically listed, but they're a logical extension of expressed powers. Think about what the word implied means. Implied, you don't really say it, but people know what you mean. It's implied. And so implied powers, they're not listed, but they uh, are an extension of an express power. For instance, Article 1, Section 8 says Congress has the power to collect taxes, right? Yep, that's the very first one they say. But there's nothing in the Constitution that says they can create the IRS. It doesn't say that. However, it's implied that if you can collect taxes, you need an agency to do the tax collecting. So the federal government establishing the IRS, it's not an expressed power because IRS isn't mentioned in the Constitution, but it's implied. They need it to carry out their expressed duties. Uh, building interstates. 
Nowhere in the Constitution does it say Congress has the power to build interstates. However, they do have the power to regulate interstate commerce. And if there's trade between the states, that's interstate commerce. So a logical extension would be roads or trains. They have the right to regulate uh, railroads. And so those are implied powers. They're not mentioned, but you need them. Where do we get the idea of implied powers? It's Article 1, Section 8, the very last one. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution their for the foregoing powers. So this is a catch-all. They, the necessary and proper clause basically says if Congress needs to do something else to make sure that they do these above things, these things up here, they can do it as long as it's necessary and proper. If it's necessary for them to uh, do, then they can do it. This is also called the elastic clause. Think about elastic. It stretches and the necessary and proper clause allows Congress, allows the federal government to stretch their powers. We also have inherent powers. Inherent powers, I like to call just because powers. They are powers that the national government has just because they're the national government. For instance, no, it doesn't give in the, it doesn't say in the constitution that they can conduct foreign affairs. But that's kind of not obvious, isn't it? That the national government would talk to other national governments? Well, yeah. Why? Because they're the national government. Or uh, acquiring new territory. Well, yeah, the national government's responsible for, you know, or can expand, can acquire new land. Why? It's the national government. It's the just because. And so we have express powers. They are specifically listed. Implied powers, they're not specifically listed, but we need them to carry out their express powers. We have inherent powers as well. Inherent are just because powers. We also have reserved powers. Reserved powers are state powers. They are called reserved powers because the, these powers were not delegated to the national government. If something is not delegated to someone, it's reserved to someone else. And so the Constitution doesn't say anything about uh, law enforcement. So law enforcement is actually a reserved power. Uh, health of the citizens. That's not mentioned in the Constitution either. So it's going to be a reserved power. Uh, schools. Schools aren't mentioned in the federal government or in the Constitution. So that's going to be a reserved power. Uh, doctor's licenses and barber's licenses and marriage licenses. That's not mentioned in the Constitution as a federal government power. So what is it? A reserved power. And if we look at the Constitution, if we go down, we're at Article 9 or Section 9, 10, we have to go all the way to the amendments. Let me go back up. I'm sorry, guys. We go here. And if we scroll down, this is a very important amendment. Yeah, where is it? Here it is. I thought I had it pulled up. I apologize. If we go down to the 10th, mm, hold on, hold on, hold on. Guys, I'm sorry. I thought I had it pulled up and I don't. If we just go to the 10th amendment, here we go. Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States nor uh, by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively. 
So here we have it. It's in the Constitution as Amendment 10 that specifically says if it's not a federal government power, if it's not listed in Article 1, Section 8, it's a state power. It's reserved to the states. And here we have it right here. The 10th Amendment says that. And that was a something that the anti-federalists wanted. The federalists said, hey, don't worry about it. We got it. If it's not in there, they can't do it because we have a limited government. And the anti-federalists said we want it in writing. And so it was put in as the 10th Amendment. Anything that's not a federal government power is reserved to the states. So we have reserved powers. They're also called state powers. So if you want to take a stop here, you can pick this up in a couple minutes. But we have express powers, implied powers, inherent powers, reserved powers. What are we at to now? Concurrent powers. Concurrent means at the same time. So these are shared powers. These are powers that both the national and state governments have. Both governments can have a court system. We have a national court system and a state court system. We have the ability to make laws. We have federal laws and state laws. Uh, both can borrow money. Both can uh, well, I have make laws, build roads. And so uh, there are some things that both governments can do, both the state and the federal governments can do. And we call these concurrent powers. It's at the same time. And these here, it's in B, establish courts, make and enforce laws, build roads, provide education, borrow money, spend money. Those are all uh, concurrent powers. So both of them can do it. What would happen if a state government passed a law that conflicted with the federal government? So let's say the federal government says, no, you can't do this. And the state government says, yes, you can. What happens? Well, we have an answer for this. It's in Article 6, and it says the federal government wins every time. It's called the Supremacy Clause. So if we go back to the Constitution, go to Article 6, which is towards the very end, Article 7, Article 6, right here, the second paragraph. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, dot, 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 shall be the supreme law of the land. That means the federal law trumps state law. Anytime there's a conflict, federal government wins. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what about all this marijuana laws, states passing laws legalizing marijuana? You know, Illinois has passed it uh, for recreational use. Missouri, it's just for medicinal use. Isn't marijuana illegal? Well, we're, this is still a gray area. We are still working this out. Uh, in the end, it will be worked out. But right now, it's just a gray area. It's still fairly new uh, to our government. And so the ideas of the state saying, yes, you can, and the federal government saying, no, weed is illegal, it's still playing out. But the Supremacy Clause says the federal government wins if there is a conflict with the states. So there's concurrent powers and anytime it conflicts, go to Article 6. So we have express powers, implied, inherent, reserved, concurrent, now denied powers. There are some things that the Constitution says, federal government, you cannot do these things. And we're going to look at Article 1, Section 9. And there are some things that the Constitution says states, you cannot do these things. And we're going to look at Article 1, Section 10. So let's go to this right now and look at denied powers. Denied is easy. Denied is no. So Article 1, Section 9. Let's look at this. Uh, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended. 
Writ of habeas corpus means you have a right to go before a judge. And so that it, Article 1, Section 9 is saying the government cannot suspend this privilege. It also says no bill of attainder. What's that? Congress passing a law saying that you're guilty of a crime. So you can't be convicted of a crime by Congress passing a bill or passing a law. They said you can't do that. It's denied. Section 9 is all no-nos. You cannot have an ex post facto law. It says no bill of attainder ex post facto law shall be passed. What's an ex post facto? It's a Latin phrase that means after the fact. Let's take, for instance, today you're driving down Highway 67. Speed limit 60 miles an hour. And being a good citizen as you are, you're going 60 miles an hour exactly. Tomorrow, Bonterre City Council lowers the speed limit to 50 miles an hour on the highway. And now, the next day after that, a police officer comes to your house, knocks on your door, and says, Hey, two days ago, I caught you going 60 miles an hour on Highway 67. Speed limit's now 50 miles an hour. Here's a ticket right here for going 10 miles over the speed limit. That would be an ex post facto law. And you can't do that. You can't make something illegal when it was legal at the time. I hope that makes sense. No direct tax shall be laid. No uh, taxes on exports. No preference shall be given of one state over another. Uh, no money shall be drawn from the treasury except by appropriations made by law. No titles of nobility shall be granted by the United States. So Congress can't make someone a duke or a prince or a duchess. No titles of nobility. And so all these Article 1, Section 9 says, federal government, you cannot do this. No. Where's my mouse? No, 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 no. You cannot do this. Now, Article 1, Section 10, no state shall enter into a treaty. No state shall grant letters of marquee and reprisal. No state shall be able to coin money. No state shall lay any imposts or duties. No, ta no tax on imports or exports. No state shall keep a navy in time of peace. No state shall enter into an agreement with another state. No state shall enter into an agreement with a foreign nation. Missouri can't declare war on Mexico. So these are denied powers by the state. It's all no, no, no. You cannot do this. So these are denied powers. Like I said, if you want to take a break, take a break. Uh, we are almost through, though. So uh, what we have, we know under the articles, each state was independent of each other. It was 13 independent states. Uh, and if you remember the Articles of Confederation, we called it a firm league of friendship. Well, under the Constitution, we forced the states to start working with each other. And one of the big ways that we did this is through Article 4 of the Constitution. We're going to take a look at this. But uh, with uh, Article 4, it, uh, it has several things. And one thing that it says is the national government's going to protect the state governments. So they said right off the bat, here's our commitment. Here's this idea of federalism, even though the national government's supreme in its laws, the national government has some responsibilities. So the national government and B is going to protect us. The national government promises to treat every state equally. The national government isn't going to tax people of one state more than another. The national government can admit new states, but it can't make a new state out of a current state. Congress can't say, you know what, we're going to have an East Missouri and a West Missouri now, or a North Missouri and South Missouri. Can't do that without our permission, but they can't do that. The national government is going to make sure each state 
has a Republican form of government. They're going to have a democracy. So let's look at Article 1, Section 4 real fast. Section 10, 8, 7. Oh, we're at Article 4. Article 2, 3. Article 4 right here. So it says uh, down here, the U.S. shall guarantee in, uh, to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. That's why I said uh, they're going to protect uh, each state from invasion. Section 3 is about new states right here. So you can see it's kind of dealings with or dealings between the national government and states. You know, the national government says, hey, we're going to make sure you have this. We're not going to, we can't do this to you. Uh, <clears throat> Section 2, uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause. That means every state has to treat each citizen equal. Uh, you have to, uh, let's say you're in Chicago and you call the police because there's an emergency and they say, hey, you're from Missouri. Oh, sorry, we can't help you. Or they, uh, you check into the hotel and they say, oh, you're from Missouri. We have triple tax on you. They can't do that. You, uh, each state has to treat citizens of other states equally and fairly. Article 4 also has the uh, one of the most important parts of the Constitution, and it's a very important part of federalism. And here it is. It's the full faith and credit clause. Section 1. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. That sounds complicated, but it's not. Full faith and credit simply says every state has to honor all the other states' records, judicial proceedings, uh, and acts. I'll give you an example. You go, I have a Missouri driver's license. I go to Illinois. Is my Missouri driver's license still okay? Is it still valid? Yes. Why? Article 4, Section 1. Illinois has to recognize my driver's license from Missouri. That would be crazy if we had to have 50 different driver's licenses or a different driver's license every time we went to another state. I'll give you another example. I got married in Florida a couple of years ago. I got married in Florida. I have a marriage license from Florida, from Tampa. Or, yeah, Tampa. Am I still married in Missouri? Yep, I am. Do I have a Missouri marriage license? Nope. I have a Florida marriage license. Why? Article 4 says Missouri has to accept Florida's marriage licenses. And if someone were to get divorced, you don't have to go to all 50 states and file for divorce. If you get divorced in Missouri, you're divorced everywhere. Why? Article 4, Section 1. Full faith and credit clause. Each state has to honor other states' licenses, records, etc. Uh, this is what I continue talking about, the full faith and credit clause, uh, the privileges and immunities clause. Uh, that's in there. This is all Article 4. Hey, guys, we made it through. Long section, I know. Uh, but lots of very important stuff. Uh, my advanced government class, like I said, we spent an entire unit on federalism. We spent like three weeks talking about this. It's really important. It's a, a bedrock foundation. We're used to it now. Of course, if I drive in Illinois, my Missouri driver's license is valid. Duh. And of course, if I get married in Florida, I'm still married in Missouri. Duh. But that's federalism there. That is. We know there are some things that only the federal government can do. We know there are some things that the states can do. And we know there are some things that both of them can do. And there's some things that neither of them can do. That's federalism, guys. We're going to pick up on Section 2 in a few days. We have some homework assignments that deal with federalism and who has the power and whether it's an expressed power, or implied power, and denied power. So we're going to hit that again with a few assignments. Um, we're actually going to watch another video, or we're going to watch a video on federalism. It's pretty good. Uh, 
If you have any questions, shoot me an email. Until next time, talk to you later.